Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. And I am taping this on an absolutely freezing day. It's New York City. It is evening already on December 12th, 2019. I'm here in the States for a few days, combination of personal and professional. And I am so happy to be sitting once again with Tuvia Tannenbaum, the very noted author whom I've interviewed before, but usually in Jerusalem. So this time I've come to him uh, in his apartment in, uh, in New York City, where he and his wife reside for part of the year. And he has a new book coming out. So first of all, Tuvia, thank you so much thank for... You for inviting me. Thank you, listeners, ladies and gents, for listening. It's a pleasure to meet you all. I am very pleased and happy to see you, Eve. Likewise. So uh, as we're sitting here, we're getting the at least the exit polls of the election in England, which in the United Kingdom, which is very interesting because that is the topic of this fifth book that you have put out. Maybe just remind my listeners, we've done a couple of interviews, what your previous books have been and what the common theme is that you've now moved in uh, into the fifth one. The first book is uh, I Sleep in Hitler's Room. It's about Germany. The second book is about Catch the Jew, about Israelis and the Palestinians and the Europeans who live there. The third book is uh, The Lies You Tell. That's about America. The fourth book is about, it's called Hello Refugees. That's about the refugees in, in Europe, uh, mainly in Germany. And now this book, The Taming of the Jew, is about Britain. Great title. Did everyone them, get it? Taming of the Jew? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and all of them uh, basically is the same idea. The idea is uh, to go into a country, rent a car, turn the engine on, start driving as much as you can, many hours, and stop every half an hour, an hour, and talk to people. You never know where you sleep the next day, usually, unless you're in a big city, you're planning to head, to stay in the city bigger, but otherwise you never know where you're going to sleep the next day. You never know whom you're going to meet, unless on a rare occasions when you make the interviews, the, the appointments before, but usually it's no appointments before, just like you go. And you try to get the spirit of the people, the spirit of the nation, what's going around you, who are the people. It's like the lonely planets of the soul, to speak, you know, so to speak. You know, it's not about which hotels you should take and which restaurants you should, even though sometimes I'll mention hotels and restaurants, whatever it is, but it's about the people. So it's a journey that, you know, nonstop, every day, 14 hours days, 12, 14 hours days, then you come to your hotel, then you sit down and you write, and this has gone on for six, seven months, and it's excruciating, it's tiring, but it's amazingly amazingly exciting and 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 I, I live for it I love it I think what resonates with a lot of your readers and I know that you do book tours and you speak in all kinds of places is that um, you're getting into kishkas you're getting into the oh, I can't translate it as intestines because yeah, yeah. that yeah. just sounds terrible but you're not because you're catching people kind of unawares, you're meeting someone in the dry cleaning store, you're meeting someone, you've got a flat tire and you start talking to the guy fixing it. You're getting the real people, not the facades, not the someone who's got the press you're secretary. The who yeah, you get the real people and, and when you meet the big guys, you also try, or the big girls, you also try to make it, you know, on the spots to avoid the spokespeople and all those things, you know, that's what you try to do. Yeah, and you try to get to the gist, I mean, to the soul of the people. You try to get really what they think. And because of my accent, which is undefinable, and because of the way I look, you know, with a big belly, and the <laughs> schlakers, you know, you know. He's got suspenders on, so who knows where he's from. Exactly, and, and the, the, the glasses that always look like, uh, God knows where I got them from, actually in New York City. I change glasses usually for every book. And... And people see me, and, and, and I try over it every time, you know, I try not to be official. I tell people I'm a journalist, but I try to, you know, I befriend the people first, you know. And, and if you, you like your interview, no matter what they think, you know, they are going to give you what they, th what they think about issues. And that's what's very interesting about it. It's, 
It's you chat with the people before you make the interview. You make them feel comfortable, and you ask basically stupid questions. You know, it's like it doesn't take much. You ask people stupid questions, and for example, when I realize that the uh, people in Britain are obsessed with Jews and Israel and whatever, I remember I interviewed a, uh, an example. You know, so when I figured it out, so I changed my my questions. Like, for example, I'm interviewing a politician. You know, a mayor. And I never met her before. I don't know who she is. I hardly know her name. And I know nothing about her. And then I said to her, Lord Mayor, as far as I understand, if I remember correctly, you have a very strong interest in the Middle East. Is that correct? And she goes like, how did you know that? That's shocking. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, because we all think against Israel. So it's like, you know, so you start asking like different kind of questions. Like I would see like, three guys going on the streets, you know, young men, and I asked them the most stupid question I could ever imagine to ask people. For example, I said, um, tell me, guys, you look really nice kids, nice students. I want to ask you a question. At what point in your life have you started loving the brown people of Palestine? When, when was it? Were you born with this love? I mean, is this like something coming from the home of your mama? Is it something you fell in love with the brown people of Palestine, let's say, at age one, your first year, or was it like when you were 10 year olds, when you were 20? I mean, now, it's like at what point did you wake up and, uh, you know, what point, you know, that you woke up and you say to yourself, wow, I love Palestine. Now, this is a stupid question. You know, if I didn't know what the people think from before mm -hmm. going around and talking to people, I would never ask this question. I mean, this is like if you ask me this question, I'd like, are you out of your mind? And they answered this, took it seriously. Yeah, I think I started in my teenage years. That one says, yeah, I, when I was 14, I started having this feeling. Mm. You know, it's like people answer like really <laughs> answers to the most stupid questions. But yes, you have to... You have to understand the people, you have to understand the mindset, and the more you understand the mindset, the more you, you on down, I mean, it's like you sharpen your questions, and there are always questions that you have not, people usually have not been asked. Like, I would go, and I say to a person, you know, because we have the cameras and everything, I'd go see, and I students coming out of a Tesco store, for example, and I'm going to say to him, my dear friend, my name is Ahmed. I'm from the Palestinian TV. Would you like to talk to my brothers and sisters in Palestine? And he goes, yeah, cool, yes. And then he goes, and he goes to, and I said to him, talk to the camera. And he talks to the camera. It's like, you'll never believe it. And then he goes oh. like, free Palestine. And then he apologizes practically that he did not pick arms, pick up arms to fight with the Palestinians against the Jews. I mean, this is like amazing, but... This is, you realize, as you walk along, I mean, it's like my first day I started, in order to understand the, the issue of Brexit is, is the, the most complicated issue of Brexit, the most burning, the most important issue of Brexit, the most unsolvable issue of Brexit is the border. The border between, if Brexit, if the UK gets out of, of, the, of the EU, there should be a border. So where is the border is between, on the highland of Ireland, mm -hmm. you know, because... Northern Ireland is part of the EU, and, and the rest of Ireland is the Republic of Ireland, which is not a part of, <coughs> which is not a part of the UK. I mean, you know, Northern Ireland is part of the UK. So, will the border be between Northern Ireland and Ireland? Mm. That was before, before the Good Friday Agreement. You know that will, you know, that you had like post of police, army, and you know, and and customs and all of that. And that was the worst. I mean, people were killing each other. I mean, bombs were flying all over, flying all over and exploding everywhere, including in London. So I, was, so I wanted to be to, to see it. So I started the journey into the United Kingdom. I started the journey in the Republic of Ireland. So my first interview, a guy named Mike, I said to him, explain to me, tell me about your people. Tell me about the Irish people. And he starts talking, and he says, well, we have the unionists, he explains to me, the, the ones who want union. We do, we, we, do, we do UK, with the Brits, who consider themselves British. We have the Republicans, you know, like the Sinn Féin, and we have the, you know, historically, the, the Catholics and the Republicans, you know, and all these things. 
loyalists, unionists, you know, it's like all the names that they are using. We've been killing each other, bombing each other for God knows how many years. <coughs> we can't seem to agree on anything, but there's one thing we agree on. All of us don't like Israel and don't like Jews. So this was my, my entry, my, my into the world of Ireland and Britain. So um, when I was in Ireland a few years ago, A, there is no border. Like the only difference is, is that when you go from, the, it goes from the metric system into, well, it goes from the English system into the metric system. Although I have to say that the music on the, the radio was better in Northern Ireland than it was in Southern Ireland. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, but other than that, if you don't know that you're going from, let's say, you know, from miles into kilometers and you don't notice some little things. And also the currency, of course, is changing. I mean, you can see nothing. I mean, yeah. just here it's kilometers, here it's miles. Right. You pay in pounds, you yeah. pay in euro. Yeah, and you're paying euro and you're paying pounds. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, but basically it's like, there's nothing you can see on the road. Right. I mean, on the border, but, and that's the question, you know, that's what the fear, what happens in Brexit? How mm -hmm. do to make the border? To make the border in the sea between in, in Northern Ireland and the island of Britain, I mean, in the British, you know, that's it's not good because then you treat Northern Ireland differently than you treat the other ones. The Northern Ireland, the Northern Irelanders don't want that. So this is basically the question. So that's where I started. I started with Ireland, then I moved to the border, border towns. I got to Londonderry, you know, got into Belfast, and I met all the. It's like amazing, you know. It's like you start even in Dublin, you know, on the in the mayor, the Lord Mayor. He tells me that you know. On the, uh, you know, they fly the Palestinian flags, they believe in Hamas, you know, it's like all kinds of things, you know, it's like they have nothing else to do but in Dublin to fly the Palestinian flags, you know, mm -hmm. on top of City Hall. And stupid things like that. Then you cross over and you go to Derry, London Derry, whatever you call it, because everybody calls it differently. It depends if you want to be Brits, if you don't want to be Brits, if, if you want to be in the Union, then you call it London Derry, otherwise you call it Derry. They're, they're arguing about Shigas, everything, even the names of towns. So, and then you see Palestinian flags all over. It's like amazing. You know, everywhere you go, everywhere you drive, you see Palestinian flags. I was told there are also Israeli flags. I didn't see even one. I went West Belfast, East Belfast, you know, of course, there is, as I just said to you. Then I went to, to a pub just to understand what's going on. Put cameras on. We record going to it easy, my wife. And we have people with cameras and, and sound equipment, big machines. So it's clear that you're a journalist. You're yeah, not sneaking say, in say, in any way. Say it, and I say my name, you know, and I say my name. I say, I'm a German journalist. How are you doing? And and they see that you, you're recording everything. They say, so what's the story of the old flags of Palestine that you have here? And they explain to me, you know, because of those damn cursed Jews. You know, and then they say, you know, all kinds of horrible things, you know, like, you know, Hitler didn't finish the... The one mistake Hitler did, he didn't didn't finish them all. So it's not so much that they're pro-Palestinian as they are anti-Semitic? Yeah, it's obvious. You know, it's like, what do they care about Palestine? This is what anti-Semitism. And, and, and then you go also to Scotland and you see the same thing. You see Palestinian flags here and Palestinian flags there. You see all these organizations, Solidarity, Scotland Solidarity, Glasgow Solidarity with Palestine, this campaign for Palestine, whatever. Is Scotland as bad as Ireland? Because I know I interviewed someone from, from Ireland a few months ago, and he said Ireland is in a class of itself, also in terms of BDS and a lot of the work Ireland, that they're doing. Ireland. And I haven't been to Scotland, but my family, my husband and sons were there a few months ago, and like they wore, you know, kippah, and they didn't feel... They didn't feel the kinds of threats that we've felt, let's say, even in Paris or in other places like that. But you think Scotland is also Scotland over there? Is the same thing, but it's, 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 but maybe it's, they're drunk all the time, so no, they're happier I about it. I don't think oh. anybody is drunk all the time. I mean, but they are different kind of people. They are not the Irish people. Irish people are more hard going. You know, they are more like boom. They will tell you everything and they start telling you stories, start telling you everything they think. The Scots are less than uh -huh. that. They are. In between the Irish and the, and, and the English, kind mm -hmm. of. You know, so they are not They've got so filters. extroverts, you know, yeah. they are not, so okay. they are filters. But otherwise, go to Buchanan Street, you know, it's like, you know, big shopping street, you know, on a weekend in Glasgow, for example, you know, and, and the roads over there, all the big shopping, you know, it's no cars, you know, just like... Mm -hmm. The pedestrian mall. Pedestrian mall. Mm -hmm. And you see 
was low cover and you see I, I tried to go to Apple store and, and in front of the Apple store are people standing with huge Palestinian flags and you go and you see okay you see here something like a tent a stall Palestinian stall a Palestinian stall and a Palestinian stall and a Palestinian stall and a Palestinian stall and even if it's not a Palestinian stall you know like of every kind of uh, NGO you know this kind of solidarity loyalty Palestine whatever it is none of them almost you know it's like all this NGOs, pro-Palestinians, you know, none of them are actually Palestinians. They are white people, white Scots. You know, and this you realize only when you go and you talk to the people, you stop at the stalls and you talk to the people and you see where the people. The ones where I saw, one stall that I saw Muslims, there was a stall called, called Free Quran. You can go there and pick up a Quran for free. That's where Muslims, not one white person. But uh, outside of the Quran stall, you know, and then if you go to the communist stall, you know, they have also a stall, a communist stall, and you can buy all kinds of chachkes, you know, and some of the chachkes, of course, are the different kinds of flags of Palestine. Mm. I mean, so, so the, the Palestine there is, is like it's the same as Shigas, as, as, you know, they are just not so extrovert in, 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 you know, in their behavior, but, but it's a very similar kind of people, you know. So and, this is the cause. But the but it's caused with a sinister. Like I remember when I was growing up, so there was Greenpeace, there was Save the Whales. There's always a cause that a lot of people want to latch cause. onto that makes them feel good. But the sinister side of this particular pro-Palestinian cause is that it's not really about the Palestinians. It's, it's a about, way of subverting anti-Semitism and anti-Israel. The examples that I like to give is, is like Shrewsbury, that's in England. You know, that's the city of uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin. And I, and I met a guy, you know, Alex, and why I remember him, because, because he's a really good guy, you know, and he's a thinker, you know, he just he's finished college, finished university, and he's starting his own business. And he explains to me, you know, that he doesn't believe the media, the media is fake news on, on either side, right or left. He, everything he investigates, you know, and, and, and he tells me that there's one issue that really bothers him, that he made a lot of examining it, and it really bothers him in... And it's Palestine, you know, what Israelis are doing to the Palestinians, you know, and, uh, you know, just, they just killed 40 Palestinian children in one day, you know, bam, 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 boom. And then I ask him, you know, it's like, what do you think about uh, the situation in Chechnya? You know, I mean, the Russians were bombing them, you know, going with planes, bombing everybody till they put them into submission. What do you think about what happens to the Muslims, since you obviously care about Muslims? What do you think about Muslims in, in China? You know, I mean, China is talking like a million Muslims or so in a, a forced education. And what do you think about what happens in Yemen, you know, on all those places, you know, when basically the Sunnis and the Shias kill each other? You don't think about the Kurds, because obviously you're like brown people. What do you think about the Kurds? You know, it's like, and everything I say, I said, I don't know about it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you about it. I said, so the only issue you care about is about Palestinians. Can you explain to me why a thinker like you? That's the only issue you think. And I just well, you know what? I really don't know. Wow. It's interesting that you ask me this question. I, it, it never occurred to me. Because you really believe me. I, I, I don't follow the news. I mean, it's like, I don't believe in the news. If I don't, you know, even history, I check everything. For example, they say that six million Jews were murdered in World War II, what they call Holocaust, I found out this is not true. The story is really, but now I'm going home, I'm, I'm going to think about it. You know, it's like, and, and subsequently more people, the same things, they don't know why they think only about this. They just don't know. This is the issue that bothers them, this is the issue they care about, but you don't know about. Why do you think that is? That... We'll get, we'll get they know, but, but, okay. yeah, but it's interesting. Like if I, if I ask people to say, "Give me the the five, you know, you go to the, to place a student. Give me the five most arable states in the world." So they give me, obviously, you know, Russia, you know, places like this. And I say, "Why didn't you put Iran? Why didn't you put Israel? Why didn't you put China?" China, and say, "Oh, you are right. Israel with the Palestinians. I forgot to put it." <laughs> it's like. It's like immediately click something, and why is it? It's it's anti-Semitism. It's anti-Semitism, pure. It's not, they don't care about the Palestinians. You know, they don't care about the Palestinians living in Jordan. If I tell them the stories, like horrifying stories of Palestinians living in Jordan, which I have seen personally, witnessed because I travel in Jordan too. So, 
and I know other Palestinians live there. For example, they, they don't care. They don't, they don't love the Palestinians. They don't love them. They don't care about the killing in Yemen. They don't care about getting in Syria. They don't care. It's because the Jew is in the middle. And why is it? It's, it's, it's a classic anti-Semitism. It started with the divorce, so to speak, or the split between Judaism and Christianity around 2,000 years ago. But especially since Rome adapted Christianity as, as a state religion. You know, before that it was, I mean, Christianity started, you know, with, with so the Jewish sect, a small Jewish sect, and they are the followers of Jesus. And in, in, if you read the New Testament, you see Jesus saying to his people, to the Jews, when they're arguing with the Jews, he says to them, you speak in the name of your father, the devil, and I speak in the name of my father, God, father in heaven. You know, stuff like that. You know, Jesus goes to the temple in Jerusalem, and what does he see? Money changers on the steps in the court of, of um, and he throws the things. So, so, at the time, it was basically between Jews and Jews, which is okay. You know, two Jews arguing, look to Israel you know, and they say the worst things to each other. But when it became Jews and Christians, you know, and the non Jews, now we have in the New Testament that the Jews are good with money. I mean, they are like money changers, and also they are the children of the Satan. So from this we know everything. I mean, there's nothing else. And it says, you know, and also it says in the New Testament that the only people who have a veil over their face and they cannot see the real truth and the, the real glory of God are the Jews. But then again, this was Jews talking to Jews. But it only became Jews not talking to Jews. We know, we know the history of 2,000 years of persecution of blood libel. By the way, the first blood libel was in England. I didn't know that. I didn't know all these things before. So... That's the explanation, and, and, and England, because, again, I, I understood it only when I was there, especially in England, but the rest of Britain too, it's, it's the monarchy. And I always wondered, why do we need this alter cocky? I'm sorry to say that, you know, this old lady over there, or, or her son was going to pick up, you know, with big, big ears. Why do you need them? <laughs> I mean, why do you need this too much to go him? I mean, it's like, what's the point? And, but when you are there and you talk to the people and you realize this is, this is like at the core of their being. Mm -hmm. It's an hierarchy system. It's it's the system of the blue blood, you know, the, the right. you know, the elite versus the poor. I call it the cat and the rats, you know, and 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 that's the whole thing. Everybody is boxed, and the Jews are also boxed, and they are boxed in a, not a nice place, and that's basically what you have. So some people would say that. We had the waves of anti-Semitism, to put it mildly. The Crusades and the Inquisitions and the pogroms were based on Christian theology. The Jews killed Jesus, and, their, and with our mother's milk, we learned that we have yeah. to hate the Jews. But there are those who say that the modern anti-Semitism, if you will, 21st anti-Semitism, is not that. That it's a political anti-Semitism because, you know, it's, it's Israel represents the Jews. What you're saying here, though, is that it's a mix? No, no, no it's not a mix. It's like I, I don't accept the other thing. I mean... I infiltrated those organizations. I know those organizations, the people. I, I, I travel a lot in Europe. I met, I, I've been with the extreme right and extreme left and everything in between. It's, you see, it doesn't matter that the people, like in Germany, for example, or in Britain or whatever it is, you know, in modern Western Europe, many do not believe in God anymore, many do not believe in Jesus, many don't believe in anything. But that thing, the culture, it's embedded in the culture. It's it's not in the DNA of the people. It's in the DNA of the culture. It's like you go up with it. You know that. Mm -hmm. You know that the Jews have money. You know that the Jews are killers. You know that the Jews, for no reason, invaded a country that existed called Palestine. You might not know. You might not know where it is. And if you ask you what's the distance between Jerusalem and Israel, as I did sometimes, people didn't know the difference. People didn't know. Could not tell me the distance between Jerusalem and Palestine. You know, it's like wow. It's, it's, it's like stupid things people didn't know, but it's not about knowing that. It's they so just know that the, the Jews came to a place that was Palestine, changed the name to Israel, mm -hmm. and killed everybody, and still are enslaving the people and killing them for breakfast. It's that's what it is. Mm -hmm. There is nothing more to it, nothing less. It's embedded in the culture. It's like you know. I was a Haredi Jew. I'm not a Haredi Jew anymore. I still love Gevel Devesh. It's, call it in my blood, call it whatever it is. It, it's, and if I had children, I don't, I would feed them Gevel Devesh too. 
And I would also love gefilte fish. There are good gefilte fish, by the way. For oh, those who don't know, two of you grew up in a very ultra-Orthodox yeah. world. I love the kugel. I mean, it's like I still love those things. I mean, it's like you can take it away from me. It doesn't have to do. I mean, I go to Schenken Street. You know, I remember, you know, it's like, you know, when Schenken Street used to be uh, totally left. It's not anymore that. But when it was like totally left, you know, and, and you'd go to this restaurant on, on, on Saturday, Shabbat afternoon, and you could order the best chant in the world, the best kugel in the world. This, you know, those uh, totally chilonim, totally a Jewish atheist, socialist, you know, Palestinian lovers, you know, Gaza beloveds. You know, it's like, what do they do on Shabbat afternoon? Mm-hmm. You know, with the, the traditional Shabbat traditional afternoon Shabbat. stew. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the chant. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, they buy it. You're not supposed to buy it. You're not supposed to be in the shop, but who cares? There are things that are still, you know, they are embedded in you because you're embedded in the culture. You hear about it, you know about it. Mm-hmm. It goes from generation to generation. And and that's what you have. And while I did not want to cover anti-Semitism in Britain because I didn't think it existed, because I thought, you know, it's a great country, I want to cover theater because I love British theater, especially English theater. That's how it's my idea to write a book, covering English theater. British, but mostly English theater, because I think it's the best theater in the world. At least I thought so. That's what I want to go there. And because Brexit is happening, so I said I'll cover Brexit too. That's why I started, instead of starting in Northern Ireland, I started in Ireland. The idea was not to cover anti-Semitism. You, so you got a surprise. Of course. From the day two, I mean, from the first interview. And then it went on and on and on. And I saw more and more people doing the same stupid thing. But that's what it is. It's it's embedded in the culture. It's people think. And I remember I asked one one thing. This is I asked a you um, in a university in a university college in London, UCL. I asked one of the teachers over there, explain to me all this whole thing because I interviewed like eighteen year old students and and they told me how much I love Corbyn, how much I care about the Palestinians. You know, like it's like what is this with these kids? And he explained to me, and he said, Palestine is a state of mind. Mm. It's a brilliant observation that I never thought about it. Palestine is a state of mind. You don't have to know where it is. You don't have to know what it is. You don't have nothing. The state of mind. You have to check it. So a Palestinian state in that case already exists, because if it's a state of mind, it's it's the biggest country in the world. It's a state of mind. And then there are Jews coming and and plundering it. But that's what it is. So you have the image... So and you have the image of those Jews who take like little minority people, you know, and basically rape them and murder them. And that's it. Where is it? Who cares? Is it in South America? Is it in mm-hmm. in, in uh, God knows where? Is it in Africa? No, nobody cares. You know, there is this, this beautiful place called Palestine that's been plundered by Jews, and that's it. I'm amazed at how optimistic you are, because. I mean, I I think I, I thought it was clear. When I say optimistic, I mean about the British that you went there, that you went there, and you didn't think they were anti-Semitic. So you know, I know well, maybe also because I guide Yad Vashem and I do all these things. That Winston Churchill, for example, had to be very careful that the the English didn't think he was fighting World War II to save the Jews because they wouldn't have been behind him. And okay, Lawrence of Arabia. Okay, so there were some Brits who were also pro Jewish, but most of them were pro Arab. But I guess you could say that maybe that was geopolitical, that it was about oil. It wasn't about not liking the Jews. It was about the fact that there were a lot more Arabs than the Jews. The Arabs were sitting on where the oil was, and the British wanted the Jews that wanted the oil. So well, you know, it was reality. You know, I have been in London many, many times. You know, I had to go to London for you're from New York, go to the airport, JFK, jump on a plane, as they say, you know. And up on a plane and got to London for three, four days, just watching theater from A to Z and then coming back. In my image, you know, Britain was London. And London is theater. Mm-hmm. And in the theater, I didn't see anything anti Semitic. There were all kinds of beautiful theater. You know, like one of my favorites, you know, Blood Brothers by Wooly Russell. It's like beautiful, amazing theaters that I saw in London. And, and that's what's a Britain for me. Mm-hmm. 
So you had a very narrow focus of what Britain was, and you got your eyes very much opened up. I want to crack that thing. Why is he doing such a great theater? I mean, when an actor goes on the stage and says, my name is Lear, King Lear, in Britain, I believe him. Anywhere else, I don't believe him. I don't believe any actor. I see a Shakespearean play everywhere else in the world, outside of the English people acting it. I, I, I want to vomit. I hate Shakespeare. I love, I love to read Shakespeare, but I hate watching Shakespeare. But when the English people are doing it, I love Shakespeare. It's like a beautiful play. Doctors are not screaming the lines. They are talking the lines. You know, you see the whole story, and it, it looks like it just happened yesterday. You know, and it's a, it's a beautiful Shakespeare. It's a beautiful, amazing when it's played the way it's supposed to be played. Like a play. Let's entertain the audience. <laughs> but then you got off the West End. But it was, uh, yeah, it was exactly the West End. That's what I was. You know, it's like, that's what I know about Britain. I didn't know. I've never been before to Ireland. I've never been before to Belfast. I've never been before to Newcastle. I mean, what was the UK for me? London, like for most of the people in the world. You know, you go to visit Britain, where do you go? You go to London. So I went to the theater in London. And my ex and, and I've been so many times there. Even American shows, like, let's say, I do call it uh, the Book of Mormon. Go to see it in the West End, it's much better than to see it here. <laughs> I mean, it's like they do it better than America. It's, it's an American musical. It's amazing, it's really, with a perfect American accent, by the way. I mean, it's like everything. It's like, you know, American shows, you see in London. You know, even even shows like Angels in America. Why did I sit in London? I love London theaters. And of course, all the other shows that you know, the, the London stage. So for me, Britain was nothing connected in my brain to anti-Semitism. It was not connected. Okay, you have anti-Semitism or something. Okay, they are dealing with it with some sugar called Jeremy Rock Corbyn. Okay, they are dealing with it. It's on the media. Okay, yeah, but that's okay. not the mainstream. But this is not the mainstream, and that's what it is. It's a mainstream party, but they took it over, you know, like a group. Took it. It's not the mainstream. I read every day. I read the New York Times. I read the uh, Washington Post. I read many papers, you know. When you read the New York Times, after being in Israel and knowing what it is and, and writing about this, the New York Times is very critical of Israel, in my view. Very critical of Israel. And some of its of its most Jew haters are Jews. I mean, this is something else, you know. But after you start reading, you know, now I'm going to to England. I started reading the the Guardian every day. Makes the New York Times look positively uh, New Israeli. Times, yeah. It's like yeah. written by the settlers in Itzar. The New York <laughs> Times is a publication published in Itzar. You know, it's like the most extreme settlers in comparison to the Guardian. I mean. Hello, I mean, The Guardian is like, it's all of a sudden the, n a new world opened before me. You know, I started reading every day The Guardian, of course, The Times of London and everything. And all of a sudden it's like, and then talking to the people, and then realizing when you talk to people, what bothers you in the world, they say Palestine is like Meshuggah now. It's like, for Kalach. So, all of a sudden I understood that the anti-Semitism war is not happening in labor. It happens down there. It's the people vote for labor. It's the people who put those people in, in there, you know, in there. And that's what it is. So I remember talking to somebody a few years ago about the difference between what was happening in England and in France, where you have a lot of the anti-Jewish behavior in France is coming from the Muslims, from the, a lot of the immigrant population. And this person said to me that it's different in England. You have your pockets where Muslims in different places and towns where the police won't go into, the Muslims are living. But that's not the main anti-Semitic incidences against the Jews in England are not coming from that. I interviewed a lot of Muslims in, uh, in, 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 in Great Britain in general, mm -hmm. you know, they're all over. And eaten in the neighborhood, I went to the neighborhoods. I didn't see neighborhoods that's, you know, I think the police is all over. I have been in some tough neighborhoods, some tough Muslim neighborhoods. There was a lot of drugs. I have been there too. But more or less, I have not encountered anti Semitism very little in those places. You have to understand the Muslims in, in the UK, most of them are coming from places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. You know, Kashmir, mm -hmm. you know, India, I don't know where, like, you know, they are not coming from 
They're not Arabs. They're Muslims, not Arabs. Yeah, they're not that, you know, so. And even the Arabs who come there already, they are there. They don't care about, you know, the Jewish issue is not the issue. The main issue is totally different, you know. But they want to make the money and whatever it is. They are very religious, the Muslim. Um, you go to, for example, to the mosque, the East London mosque. I wonder. I joined in prayer. You know, I did... Uh, you look like the furthest thing from a Muslim that anyone would have in mind. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I did okay. it. <laughs> I did it. I went there. I did the push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> and I screamed, Allah Akbar, like everybody. And Israel is not on the top of them. It's a white man thing mm -hmm. and a white woman thing. It's not the... Not that they love the Jews, not that they this don't, don't not that they don't criticize the Jews, but but the, this is not the main issue. They're not obsessed with Israel and the Jews the way other people no. are. They're not obsessed. The Muslims of the to totally. So they are not obsessed with Jews. The white men and women are obsessed with Jews, and that was interesting. Okay, but that might be connected to what you said, like their Christian upbringing. The European upbringing, the which is the Christian upbringing, yeah. it's connected to that spirit. Because, you know, like in Ireland, the Christians and, uh, are not all the same. You have Catholics and, uh, and Protestants. Yeah. And there are people who make sure that this kind of anti-Semitism is never to be forgotten. These are Jews. There are all kinds of Jewish organizations, you know, which are dedicated to anti-Israel activities, to demonstrations against Israel, all kinds of God knows what names they have. And Jewish Voice for Labor, you know, all kinds of Jewish organizations. And Jewish intellectuals who have a big part in anti-Semitism mm -hmm. in every country, and that's in Britain too. And then you have the Jews who refuse to admit what's happening around you. Not one MP, Jewish, not one um Jewish and he leader. is member of parliament. Not one lord. There was an exception, one baroness. But in general, not one lord, not one Jewish leader agreed to tell me on the record that Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite, despite all the evidence. And not one of them agreed to say that the Labour Party is an anti-Semitic. They changed their spots only after some of them peace like the Luciana Berger, Louis Hellman, practically or facing this election, which means they knew that they are not going to be elected again in labor. Mm -hmm. they, they had nothing else to lose. And all of a sudden they started talking about, you know, Luciana Berger, you know, Labor is institutionally anti-Semitic, you know. Where have you been since 2015 when you started? Mm -hmm. You know, on, on, on Jeremy Corbyn was there. Where have you been there? You're not there. Uh, Margaret Hodge, you know, all of a sudden she became like a fighter against Corbyn, you know, and all this criticism of Jews and whatever. In our own page, website in our own page, the first page that are for, for our voters, for our constituencies, was one page, the, st the, the beginning, I mean, it's like the, the, the home page of the, of the website, was about Gaza and about the killing, the merciless killing of the Israeli army. And she demanded that it will be taken to to International Court of Justice and criticizing Trump for moving the embassy to Jerusalem, which is illegal. She was like the worst of the worst. Only when she became, you know, like the whole thing became like politically more convenient for them because they were afraid of losing the seats, you know, the change. When I had an interview with, her, with her, one of the Jewish officials and I said to him, and he told me about Margaret Hood, she's so supportive. What are you talking about? Did you see what she has on her website? She says, share what kind of supportive it is. She talks worse than, I mean, I mean even Jeremy Corbyn doesn't talk like her. How do you explain that the Jews and, uh, are oblivious to what's going on or they're just lying to you? Are you sure? 
And then he goes to, to the website and says, oh, God, you are right. I, I must call her. The next day, it was taken off. The whole website was taken off because it didn't fit a political schedule of political ambitions. The Jews over there are like bastards. I'm sorry. Nobody has a spine. Nobody has a spine. Particularly in the UK, of all the places that you've gone to, you find there's a difference in the Jews there? I did. Even the Jews who are fighting mm -hmm. would tell me, <coughs> off the record, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is no question in the same way, Labour parties, whatever it is, and they say to me, please don't, uh, this is off the record. I went to Limud, UK, which is like a, a week of Jewish learning, <laughs> and I was there the last two years. I'm not, I didn't go this year, or I'm not going this year. And uh, a British so friend well. of mine, well, so a British friend of mine was afraid for me to go and speak about what I speak about which is, of course, about the rights of Jews to live in Judea and pro-Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I'm not afraid to talk about it there. She said, no, but you can't do it there. I said, why can't I do it there? And I saw, and this is someone who's lived in Israel already for a long time, but you talk about something being hardwired into you. As a Brit, I saw that it was higher, hardwired into her. Lay low. Don't make waves. Don't say anything. Don't make waves. Uh, it, it won't be good. And as a result, yeah, and this is what I'm we see. I'm sitting in a kosher pizza store. I know, a kosher pizza store, I mean, you know, there is a lovely family, a couple and the children, little kids. And I asked the, the parents, I'm a journalist, I said, do you know of any anti-Semitism? It's in Manchester. So any anti-Semitism, any anti-Semitism act? They, you know, what do you think about, you know, whatever. I never experienced any anti-Semitic event, any anti-Semitic anything. Uh, and this is the, the father answering and the wife nuts. And uh, I never heard about anything anti-Semitic. Nothing. It's like it's a Jews live here. It's, just, it's not perfect. Yeah. <sighs> this is what you tell me. So I look at a kid, a six-year-old or eight-year-old, I don't know, something like that. And I say, and I say, kiddo, is Papa telling the truth or is Papa lying? And the kid, this little kid, he says, he's lying. Amazing that you did that. That kid probably didn't watch said, TV for a week. And I said, to me, tell me your story. No, it just happened to me just a few days ago. I was working with my friends, and they pelted us with, with two eggs. And they say, you fucking Jew. What were the parents looking like when you said this? Said the parents, they say, uh, is your kid lying? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot it. I said, come on, don't tell me that. And then the father talks to me and he says, what do you want me to tell you? You want me to tell you the truth? You want me to tell you how many times I've been pelted with stones or with eggs or whatever it is? Yeah. You want me to tell you that? And then they all have copycats doing it. You're a journalist. I don't want to tell you. This is the way they started. It's fine. You go to Gator. The Gator the Shiva is one of the, of the most... The number one is in, in the UK. The Gates Head Yeshiva, one of the big Torah learning centers yeah, in the world. world. Yeah. But of course, and the number one in the United States, in the United Kingdom. Go to Gated and see it. I get to Gated, I get off the car, and the first thing I look at, I'm going to see the bookstore. I'm going to look for the bookstore. And I'm going to look, I'm going to, yeah, there, there, I don't see any bookstore. I see groceries, so like, what happens? This is the Gates of the Yeshiva world, you know. So I ask a little kid, a 14 year old, I say, hey, do you have a book story? He said, yes, down the road over there, up the road over there. I say, where? I said, oh, look at this over there. I say, I don't see anything. Now let me take you there. We go, I go to the bookstore. And he stops next to a place with the shutters down. There is nothing to see anything. It looks like a construction site, actually. Nothing, everything is... No identifying closed. features that no this is a Jewish bookstore. Whatever, mm -hmm. everything is closed. The door is closed. Everything is shut down. Everything is there. I showed him, this is not a bookstore. He says, of course it is. And then he goes, he opens the door, and we're in a big bookstore. And I say to the, the guy who sells there, why, why are you covering this? It's like, what are you hiding? Are you selling some pedophilic thing over there? So it's a pedophilia articles? What is this? What are you selling us that you hide it? Some good, good stuff for smoke? <laughs> I said, what do you want me? To, to have the windows, to have the shutters up? People will throw stones at us. Hmm. This is the way they live. This is the way these people live. It's for, for, for color. You know, I mean, 
he's, we're sitting here in New York City, and just a couple of days ago, when I got to the States and then my kids got all worried because they heard there was a terrorist mm-hmm. incident in Jersey City. And one of the shocking or maybe not shocking things that's coming out is some of the interviews with the locals that are there. In this case, it was black people from Jersey City who were blaming the Jews for the attack. Until the Jews came here, we didn't have any incidences like this. You have that? Yeah. You have anti Semites all over. I mean, this is no question about it. But it's how the Jewish community reacts to it. Right. And in Britain, they are in total denial. Total denial. In Britain, they're in total denial. I interviewed the Lord, the Lord uh, Levy. It's called the Lord Michael Levy. He's a multimillionaire. He has a very good f- friend of Tony Blair. He was actually a special envoy mm-hmm. for quite a few years to the Middle East of Tony Blair. And he says to me, so I tell him some stories what the Jews told me about some violence. And he's totally denying it. He says to me, you have to be very, very careful saying those things to people, repeating those things. I don't know of anything happening in this country that's anti-Semitic. I said, you know, what about Jeremy Corbyn? Jeremy Corbyn? Jeremy Corbyn needs an education about the Middle East. That's the problem. He goes like yelling at me. You know, it's like, don't ever say there's anti-Semitism here. I never experienced it. Boom, 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 boom. It sounds like the beaten wife syndrome. Not, I don't know if it's so much denial as it is just this is the way it is. Sends me an email. This big shot, Lord Levy, sends me an email, and he said that I cannot publish anything from the interview, even though it was recorded. You know, and I asked him permission, and everything is recorded. So even I ask him permission is also recorded, unless you get an authorization from me and from my solicitors. That's lawyers for those of you who are in the, uh, not in the UK itself. Exactly. <laughs> so I sent him an email back that I spoke to my legal team in New York, my lawyers, my Jewish lawyers, obviously. And they said that since you agree to this, it's obviously perfect that I can publish it. So you are going to publish it? And then he says to me, sent me an email, he says that he spoke with his solicitors. And since the interview took place in the United Kingdom, the UK laws say that he has a right. I said to him that I spoke to my legal team, my lawyers, and they advised me that this is against the Constitution, and that since the finished product, the book is appearing in the United States, Hmm. according to the American Constitution, I have all the rights to publish it, and I will encourage you to once the book is published, to open legal proceeding against us. <laughs> so where do you think this is going? That is, that's uh-huh. it. He knows he's not, he's not, he's not, he's not, he's from the top of his head. So he's denying there is anti-Semitism, and then a week later or something like that, a few days later, he realizes, oh, what did they say? Yeah. You know? But the first thing you say, nothing. One Jewish leader after another. So tell me the same thing. That's what they are. Was this an upsetting uh, journey for you in England because it blew open some of the feelings that you had about the UK? It's an, ups- it's an upsetting, you know, but every day you go to the pub later and you try <laughs> to get over it. And there are, thanks God, there are a lot of pubs in the UK and you just get over it. And then you start another day. You try always not to get, you, you, cannot, get, you, you cannot let what you find affect you. After the journey is over, you can, you know, when I sit down with you now, I can talk to you about how frightening it is. But at the time, you, you cannot, you have to live with it, and you have to keep on to your job. You know, taking a distance from it, it's not too, via, I'm just a journalist, I'm just an author, I'm just writing what I am. That's it. You have to write a book, and that's it. There's no time for you to think, you know. You cannot allow this. I mean, I go to refugee camps, I go to... Nazi neighborhoods, I, I interviewed Nazi leaders. You can't think about it at the time. Mm-hmm. Later on, I said, oh God, I can't believe I did it. I can't believe I got myself into a refugee camp in Jordan, or I can't believe I got myself into, into I, I was the best friend of, uh, one of the best friends, I, a blood brother, so to speak, of Jibril Rajub for months. We are very, very good friends. We are very close friends. We are like, like, like brothers, we are kissing each other. I mean, it's like... Someone very high up in the Palestinian Authority, a terrorist, not a nice guy. Spending Israel for 17 years in jail. His, his sense 
was full of blood, not only of Jews, not only of Jews, but also of other Palestinians. I mean, and is Ayap is the leader of the of the PLO committee or something like that? That's what he was at the time. I don't know what he is now. But he's iron it up. I mean, it's like when he walks in the street, everybody moves around, you know, moves away. Mm-hmm. To it's like a king he walks yeah. up, yeah. and he didn't know I was Jewish. And I could not for one second think, what happens if he finds out I'm Jewish? You would kill me on the spot. I mean, when I'm in his territory, he can do that. And he supplied me with security people to protect me from the Jews. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like a funny thing. But it's the reality. Um, but at the time, you can think about it. The moment you think about it, you are done. Mm-hmm. You are totally done. So you have to completely disconnect from emotions, from fear, from anything you but the goal, which is to get the truth out from people and get it out to the world. Exactly. That's the goal and that's it. You have to totally disconnect. I don't uh, think very many people can do what you do. I don't know. I cannot talk about other people, but this is my job. This is what I do. Mm-hmm. So when I go to this place, I say, yeah, this is the way I have to think, this is the way I have to act. And mm-hmm. that's all there is to it. Really going undercover to a great degree. Basically, yeah. So one of the things that you've told me is that the books that you've written have been in term, been books that you could get into the culture. You speak fluent German, and you're very familiar with the German culture. And growing up in Israel, you're familiar with the Jewish-Israeli. You speak Arabic also, the Middle Eastern culture, if you will. And, of course, you speak fluent English, and so you've been able to go to the United States and now to England. Um, where, if... And I know that you're just finishing this book and we're talking about Taming of the Jew, which is going to be coming out within the next few months. And it's going to be a good year until it's published and you do the book tours and everything settles down. Where else can you go to uncover what it is that really only you two of Yutanabam have been able to uncover? And I know that people, it's not just me, but people who've read your books have suddenly seen like the lies they tell the book that there is more than one America. And you uncovered an America that makes some people very, very uncomfortable, but it's there. So where else do you think, or is there, is there a need for anywhere else for you to, I to go I'll there? I'll think about it once I'm done with this one. Mm-hmm. I'll think about it. Um, maybe you need to learn a new language, learn maybe Russian. I maybe I need to learn <laughs> Russian, yeah. Well, maybe. Or Mandarin, go to yeah, China. Well, exactly. I don't know yet. We'll see, we'll see about it. I have some offers different kind of offers mm-hmm. and I'll check them and but first of all I need to get this done I need to get okay so done. tell us what's happening now because you publish in a few different languages at once um, and the book is not yet available this is a teaser for all my listeners it's not like I can say to you now run out and order from Amazon Chivy Tanum's new book yeah. so what what's what's happening right now at the end of 2019 the end of 2019 uh, the book is coming out uh, in uh, Ibro in Israel in January, it'll come out in uh, in February in German, and then a few months later, by September, any time between February and September, it'll come out in English. It needs some time because the main publisher is German, mm-hmm. and I, you cannot publish something a version that is competitive because many Germans read English, ah. so you can put it in an language that is competitive to the main publisher mm-hmm. who invested in it uh, tens of thousands of euros mm-hmm. or whatever it was. I imagine that Hebrew isn't the language that you make your money in. It's This is for yeah. your people to be able to read what you're doing? Exactly. And Hebrew is like, no, I don't make money. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like all the money that I make in Hebrew is I spend much more on it just to fly to Israel, just to be in hotels, you know, and just to be, just to be the, the speaking tour, you know. With all the things that I make, you know, by the end of the day, it's it's your, your gefilte fish culture, right. Hebrew. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's my gefilte fish culture, yeah. I spend much more going there than making there. Mm-hmm. But... This, what do you expect the reaction to be when the book comes out? I never know. You can, you can, I, I, I don't engage in that kind of things. Mm-hmm. I never know. You never know how people will relate to anything. I have, you, have not, you cannot tell. Well, the other books that have come out, for example, when you exposed a lot of the that the EU and the NGOs that are working in Israel are really the Europeans trying to finish off to some degree what they didn't finish off in the 1940s. They followed the Jews into our homeland and are trying to dismantle us from within. Did you get anger, lawsuits, denials? I didn't get, I, yeah, there were from example, denials. Um, um, Betselem, that I called the chief investigator denying the Holocaust, 
says that I made it up. Well, we put the, 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 the thing on Israeli TV, Israeli TV edited it. And for quite a few weeks, you know, Bezalem was in a campaign to discredit me until I decided that I put it on Facebook, the raw material, and then Bezalem stopped, admitted that the chief investigator actually did say that. And then we had uh, the daughter of Tzachak Rabin, Lea Rabin, denied that I interviewed her. So I put the interview on YouTube, so she stopped denying. And practically after that, this... That's Dalia Rabin, Rabin. Dalia yes. Rabin, yeah. mm-hmm. After this happened, you know, the people, everybody was interviewed, realized, hey, wait a second. <laughs> he interviewed me, and there was a video machine there. <laughs> so they all realized that whatever it is, there is no point to... to so they stopped. Mm-hmm. So all these things stopped. So that's what I, I tried to make everything to a no candid camera, everything opened. Two times I didn't do that. One time was in a, when I visited a club called the 88 Club, HH Club, I Little Club, sorry, I Little Club in Germany, in Neumünster. So I didn't tell them I'm a journalist. So that's one time. And the second time was in uh, Oxford. When I met the the best friend of, uh, I think the best friend of uh, Jeremy Corbyn, mm-hmm. his soulmate, kind of, you know, they have been together for for decades, protecting each other. Uh, was known as Rat Pitt, and his real name Peter Wolfsman. And I talked to him for a few hours. Not as an interview, I just met him in a restaurant. I mean, slowly, slowly, I, in the beginning, I didn't even know where he was. You know, slowly, slowly, I realized, you know, this is this is Red Pit. This is what everybody talks about. The Jewish community tried for a long time to get him out of the NEC. He's on the NEC. And uh, the Jewish community tried to get him out. The NEC is, is basically the, the body that oversees labor. It's, you know, so they tried to get him out of labor. They tried to get him suspended or expelled. And they couldn't get him because Jeremy Corbyn always protected him. And then when we talked, he said all kinds of things. He said that all anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism in, in Britain is actually manufactured by the Israeli embassy. So the Israeli embassy in London planted a spy in a, in Labour Party. And there are the 68 rabbis who, who wrote against anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, published a letter in a, in a, the Guardian. It was actually assembled by the Jewish, by the Israeli embassy, all kinds of, and then all kinds of anti-Semitic trash. And Sounds like right out of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's the other time. That's the only that's the only, the only two times when I didn't tell the person, you know, what you are gonna say is gonna be you know. And that's it. And in order to be legally protected I I I, I published the material with with Red Pitt a few months ago. I mean it's like after I left London, after I left the UK, I published it, and it was on almost every, at least every major uh, media outlet in Britain. I I was interviewed just for this issue, you know, because I was interviewed before. I was interviewed three times for the BBC. One time was live TV, and it was on the front page of the Guardian, front page of the Times of London, and everything. And you suspended within hours, because it was a really mini storm. It is like the old, wow. German, the old British media was into it, and he's still suspended from the labor. But yes, these are the two times when I didn't do that, but every other time it's like, it's in the open, no candid camera. It's, mm-hmm. hello, I'm a journalist. My name is Toby or Tobias or Florian, whatever names I have. I have a collection of names. I'm a German. F German, F Jordanian, every time I say something else. Mm-hmm. But everybody knows that I'm a journalist. And everybody knows they are, they are being recorded. So there's no point for them to, you know, deny. to, to mm-hmm. deny it. I mean, it's like some tried, but it felt miserably. But everybody else knows that this is, I can prove it. Did you interview Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of, his, of, uh, of the UK? Rabbi Sachs refused to be interviewed by me. And uh, Rabbi Mervis also refused to be interviewed by me. Under Any no idea why? Under no condition. From the people, from British Jews, they say that they, they know that boss read uh, the Catch the Jew. They probably think that I will ask him questions that he would embarrass them, or whatever it is, and 
that's what people, British just told me, but I don't know. They didn't give me a reason. I mean, Rabbi Mervis gave me a reason. Is is he gave me a reason. Is he sent me an email that Rabbi Fry Mervis would, would love to talk to you, but uh, we checked his calendar and you will not be available for the next few months mm-hmm. with an S. You know, and I, and I, when I met him at an event, and I said, "Rabbi Fry, what's the problem?" I, I tried to. I wanted to interview you. Why didn't you want to be interviewed? And his answer was, "Hmm, hmm." Mm-hmm. I said, "Why?" Hmm. Well, he really didn't want to say anything. Yeah, it's just like he made these strange sounds, like like we are in the zoo. That was his reply. Mm-hmm. So don't ask me. Mm-hmm. Okay, I could see that they they probably felt that there was no upside for them to be interviewed by them. Because by you because it's, not, it's yeah. about me I'm not it's not for my COVID it's not for my honor mm-hmm. I mean I represent you know big media in Germany I represent also book market that is sold tens of thousands of copies in Israel yeah. not to mention you know in America so so I represent actually other people I mean it's like I represent the people it's not it's not doing for me a favor I have a lot of Jewish readers you know I mean don't do me a favor. I don't need to talk to you. I don't know. It's like, it's the last thing in my mind. I never woke up and I said, oh, I want to talk to Jonathan Zacks. Oh, I want to mm-hmm. talk to Fire Mervis. No, I, I, it's not like I'm really dying to talk to those people. You know, I, I do it also for the service of the reader, you know, and, and I think that you owe it to the reader, you know, which they're British Jews, you know, not to me. And, but they're afraid of whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So what can I tell you? I mean, there's nothing I can say. Well, if you're saying that British jury is either in denial and or is afraid, then this is their leadership. That's yeah. leadership. That, that's my thinking. Mm-hmm. I cannot sign my name to it because, you know, I don't know, but this is my thinking. They are just simply afraid. When I'm, I'm, and I interviewed one, uh, one uh, Louis Elman, MP, Dame Louis Elman, and we interviewed her in Liverpool at home. And the name of the email we wrote, the name of my cameraman was Florian. And and she agreed for the German media, for whatever it is, she got to be interviewed. And then we came, you know, and then she saw me. And she goes like, Tuvia, is that you? Oh, God, I love your books. But if I know you are the interviewer, I would have never agreed to meet you. And she didn't do the interview in the end? Or she no, did? but she did interview. The cameras were rolling the moment where you get into apartments. apartment. So she didn't have much of a choice, you know. And for now, I try to get her to say that Jeremy Corbyn, to answer me if Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite. She wouldn't do that. She wouldn't do that. So as we sit here, and the at least the exit polls came in from England, it looks like Jeremy Corbyn is not going to be their next prime minister. Um, what do you think, based on the months that you spent in England, where do you, th- where, where do you think it's going and, uh, and the effect that it's going to have on the Jews there? I mean, if, if it continues like that, I mean, if it continues, this is exit polls, if the exit polls becomes reality, I mean, uh, the main thing is Brexit. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's obviously, if it's true, then the people want Brexit, so want to finish the story of Brexit. With this or either way, they want to finish. It could story. be that the issue of Brexit has given the British Jews somewhat of a reprieve when it comes to the anti Semitism that just seems to be getting worse there. At least it won't be so much in the establishment as we've been worried about. Looks like it, at least at this point. You know, we don't know. We'll see in the next day. Uh, God knows. I mean, when you, rec- when you publish it, it's going to be after that. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's like if this holds water, I mean, if this is true, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's like. They got rid of, uh, of the danger of Jeremy Corbyn, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. I mean, the funny thing, most Jews probably are, pro- Brexit and are against Brexit, you know, because most Jews are, most British Jews are basically, traditionally, you know, before all the anti-Semitism, they are Labour voters. Mm-hmm. They're not uh, conservative voters, they're Labour. So, yeah. So if, if, if the Brexit saved them, it won't be funny because, because they are against Brexit. So. Okay. I think we're living in a world where the ironies abound 
where you see what's happening like with the Democrats and the Republicans here. You have a Republican president who's so pro-Israel and most Jews still vote Democrat. So I don't think any of us can predict anything anymore. Okay, two of you, Tannenbaum, one question about the the title, The Taming of the Jew. How did you come up with the title? Because it's it's what it is. I mean, the British Jews are so tamed to lie, you know, and they have been tamed by the British culture to lie by the British overlords, by the Gentile overlords. I mean, we are... Part of the blame of anti-Semitism is on us. You know, some Jews who who push anti-Semitism, we have a lot of, you know, Mm-hmm. Celebrating Jews, and uh, and part of it is by Jews who don't fight back, or refuse to fight back, you know, and the fact that we got to German Corbyn and the Labour Party all these things for so many years, the fact that you know, like a little kid, Hasidic Jew, if he walks outside of his neighbourhood, of his comfort zone, if it be it in London, be it in in Manchester, be it wherever it is, you know, he stands. Great chance somebody walking by to take his snatch his yarmulke and throw it out. The two living in this town, partly is the Jews who don't fight back. Mm-hmm. And you just explained why I live in Israel, where the Jews don't accept this anymore. We're done. Tuvi Tannenbaum, thank you so much. I always enjoy speaking to you, even in freezing New York City. Everybody, take a, uh, a look out in the next few months for Tuvi Tannenbaum's new book. The Taming of the Jew, Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. And a quick reminder before I sign off, if you're going to be in Israel on December 26th on Hanukkah, I've got a great day trip planned for Western Benjamin, uh, jeeping and mud and all kinds of fun. I'm just kidding about the mud. Well, maybe not. It depends if it's going to rain. Anyway, check out the One Israel Fund website. There's still room on the bus and two trips and during what's called Yeshiva Week, January 19th and 23rd. Two great, what I think, are, I mean, these are cool trips. Um, one trip to Herodian, exploring Herodian, cheese making, uh, delicious lunch, heading out to Jeremy and Ari's Aragot Farm after we've done some other things in the Stay Bar area. And on the other day trip will be between Philistia and Judea. So visiting Ashdod, the Museum of Philistine Culture, and then moving our way east across the country uh, with all kinds of interesting stops, including a delicious lunch in Tal Shachar and ending the day at the winery in Judea in Gush Etzion. So some really nice trips coming up, room on the buses. This is uh, open for the public, and I hope to see you there. I'm in the States, as I said before, for a few days. I'm going to be scholar residence in Baltimore on next Shabbat. And um, also doing a meeting for One Israel Fund this week. And reunion with the ladies from Israel Bonds, which I'm really looking forward to, in Philadelphia, just before I get on the plane to head home. On, I think it's, yeah, Sunday, December 22nd. Anyway, um, I'll just be wearing my gloves and my socks, though, because I'm not used to this cold anymore. Okay, everybody. So thanks so much for listening. As usual, great interview with Tuvia. He's really something else. Uh, Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Thanks to Tabitha. Thanks to Ben. Thanks to everybody. Take care, everybody. Goodbye for now. Hey folks, Yishai Fleischer here, and you might know that I have a show here on the Land of Israel Network, something I'm really proud of and I want you to join in. This week we're going to talk about the fight between Jacob and Israel. It's a little bit surprising, not Jacob and Esau, but Jacob and Israel. We're going to be connected.